welcome to the Jesus Movement Live. Uh, just as we start, I'm going to try and keep my volume up tonight. We've got absolutely uh, pouring rain here, so I'll do my best to uh, keep it nice and uh, clear for you. Uh, we're continuing on with our series, A Journey to Faith, and tonight we move on in, a, in the genealogy of Jesus from the time of Zerubbabel through to Abiyad, who is his son. And so Abiyad becomes one of those people in the genealogy that has no story in the Bible and yet he's firmly rooted in a period of time where there is a lot going on. So I'm just going to start off by uh, putting up a, a couple of genealogical charts. Uh, so uh, the title for tonight is Nehemiah Rebuilds the Walls of Jerusalem. And as I've just mentioned, we're now moving on to Abiyad. So in Matthew chapter 1, the genealogy of Jesus, verses 12 to 17, we have the list of the uh, descendants after the exiles of Babylon. And so we've just finished with Zerubbabel, uh, and now we're moving on to Abiyad uh, tonight. On this chart, this is, uh, this is a large chart that I have that charts all of the descendants and all of the kings. Uh, in the different empires, so I've actually moved this down into a new chart again, so there's more and more new uh, people in here. But on the far left-hand side here, uh, this is Abia here. We don't actually have any uh, dating for these descendants in the Bible, and so the best that we can do is to actually work on averages, uh, an average age between those periods, but at either end, before and after, we do have dating, so we can get a fairly accurate look. When we actually look at the averages, it works out that each descendant lives to about 59 years of age, which is fairly reasonable uh, age in these uh, times. And so the colour uh, code for Abiyad is this lime green colour. And so when we come across here, this is the remnant of the Babylonian Empire, which is finished. And so these are all of the rulers of the Persian Empire. So we've gone from Cyrus the Great, we're now down to Darius the Great, who is his great nephew. And we see here that during the life of Abiyad, we're actually going to have several changes of rulers, but if you also uh, have, have a look or you can notice, they have shorter periods of reign. Also, during this time, moving across over to here, these are the descendants that actually come down from Ishmael, so the other son of Abraham. And Ishmael, one of his sons, was called a, a Kedar, and so the Kedarites were formed from them. And the descendants of the Kedarites are quite well documented through their part of history. And we actually find here that they're actually a vassal kingdom of the Persian Empire as well, just like the Judeans. And we come down to some names down here, which I'll explain a bit later, that this fellow by the name of Gashmu, who's the son uh, of another king, is actually Geshem the Arab in the Bible, which we find in the book of Nehemiah tonight. Okay, so we find this historical uh, connection, and we find that there's a parallel between the dated periods of time, between the genealogy, the Persian Empire, and these descendants of the Kedarites. So the Kedarites are a conglomerate of uh, tribes. They're, they're not tribes that live in a fixed place, so they're nomadic tribes. And they live off to the east in the desert regions um, on the eastern side of uh, Israel. And so they would be in today's Jordan and Syria, for example. Okay, so that's just a little bit of uh, background to get started. So Abiyad, uh, who's uh, also known as Abi Chad in Hebrew, is the son of Zerubbabel, and he's the first descendant in the genealogy of Jesus to be born in Jerusalem after the people of Judah returned from Babylonian exile. Abiad is the first descendant not found uh, by name in the Old Testament, so we mentioned this last week, and but he is listed as the son of Zerubbabel in the genealogy of Jesus in the Gospel according to Matthew in the New Testament, as I've just mentioned. So now that the exiled captives of Babylonia have resettled in Jerusalem, in what's known as Yehud Medinata, the province of Judea, 
Zerubbabel and his, chi- and his children no longer had any inheritance nor authority as descendants of the former monarchy that ruled the kingdom of Judah. And so, again, just to refresh and to help you follow all this, this is now Yehud Medanata, and so it's the province of Judah. This name here, Yehud, is the Persian name for Jews, and Medanata is because it's beside the Mediterranean Sea. And so it's named the Jewish people who live next to the Mediterranean Sea. And so this is the name of, of this. Now, it's called a province, but it's actually a sub-province. It's part of a greater province. And I'm going to uh, come to that in a moment and explain a bit more about it. So all these names come up in our, in our Bibles. And so it just helps us to uh, have some visual aids So God said through the prophet Jeremiah, the priest, that none of King Jehoiakim's descendants would ever be able to sit on the throne of David or rule any more in Judah. So Abiad was now simply a citizen of the Persian Empire. He was Jewish by name, faithful to the God of his forefathers, descended from Abraham. Uh, now he, I've put uh, on that chart which I had up a moment ago, we've estimated that he was born in 507 BC when King Darius I ruled the Persian Achaemenid Empire. So Abraham uh, was born around 2000 BC. So at this point in time uh, we've covered 1500 years of uh, biblical history and everything that happens in between. Uh, his parents, and this puts some perspective in it, never forgot being forced to worship a gold statue. In Daniel chapter 3 verse 1, it says that there was a 90 feet high and 9 feet wide statue set up on the plain of Jura in the province of Babylon. This statue, dedicated to the worship of the god Marduk, resulted, if people didn't bow down to it, in the execution of their people by fire in a furnace. And we learned, of course, that when the three fellows who were with Daniel refused to bow down. We hear the story in the Bible about how they went into the furnace and they weren't burnt. And so (coughs) Abiad and his father uh, would have been around for some of these uh, events. Now that they lived in the province of Judea, they were still under the yoke of a foreign power, but God's plan to restore his people included protection against enemies who worshipped other gods, meaning that they still not free people but because they're in their own province, they're actually free to worship the God of Israel. And so that's a significant difference. The city of Jerusalem was still under reconstruction and the vast length of its walls needed for protection still lay in ruins. You may remember last week that Zerubbabel uh, was told to finish the temple of Jerusalem, but the prophets whom we read uh, relayed the word of God to say that God would be a ring of fire around to protect them and that they weren't to actually build the walls and of course he had a purpose in that and a plan because Nehemiah is going to be the person who's appointed to do that task. So Abiad was raised by God's servant his father Zerubbabel when he was a governor so he would have had a fairly privileged life at that point in time and they had hostile neighbours. But as a sub-province in the greater province of West Euphrates, they were seen as an unwanted threat, but they were protected by the command of King Darius I, who upheld the decree of his great uncle, King Cyrus the Great. So now we're going to enter into this life journey of Abiad, uh, born nine years after the Temple of Jerusalem was dedicated to God. So again, he doesn't have a personal story, but we're going to place him in the history and in the biblical journey of that time through that point in history. Now, going back to King Darius I, as I said, he's the great nephew of King Cyrus the Great, and he's the current ruler of the Persian Empire. He organised a system of taxation for the empire early in his reign. He divided his territories into 20 provinces called satrapies, and so a governor is called a satrap, and a province is called a satrapy. And each province uh, had a set tax to be paid that was called a tribute. And so I'm going to pop up this map and I'm going to uh, explain as I go, but basically 
this pink area that you can see here is actually the West Euphrates as it's known in history or the Trans Euphrates as it's known in the Bible province. And you can see it talks about the Euphrates and so the Euphrates River comes up here so it's everything on this side of it. And we see here that within this province it covers a fair bit of territory. So we've got Cilicia over here, we've got Syria, we've got Assyria in this region, we've got the former province uh, sorry, the former Northern Kingdom of Israel, which is now known as the Northern Province of Samaria. And we've got the Southern Sub-Province, which is Judea, uh, that we're just having a look at. But if you have a look on this map, I haven't included the whole empire, but it's just to give you a bit of an idea. So they had a separate uh, satrapy down here in Ethiopia, in Egypt and Libya. Uh, they had this Arabian area here, the West... Uh, Euphrates, Babylonia, and then these regions of Armenia, Cappadocia, Lydia, up to Thrace. And so they combine various different races of people, different cultures, and different uh, beliefs, and certainly no more so than the West Euphrates in which uh, Judea is placed. So that gives you a picture of that region that's mentioned through this portion of the Bible. So most of the satraps were Persian in origin and were either members of the royal house or from six families of nobility. King Darius selected them to keep an eye on his provinces, which in turn were divided into sub-provinces with their own governors, as I'm mentioning. Jerusalem and the land of Judea were in the province of West Euphrates, and under the decree of King Cyrus the Great, the Jews live, living there were given autonomy to govern themselves as the sub-province known as Yehud Medinata. Now whilst Zerubbabel, the governor of the sub-province of Judea, was accountable to a governor who we read in Ezra chapter 6 verse 6 called Tatanai, he's the satrap or the governor of the West Euphrates. So we're talking about this whole region, this is the person that we read in the Bible called Tatanai is governing. So Tatanai was also accountable because his tributes were assessed by a commission to evaluate his expenses and revenues and to ensure he could never gain too much power. He had a secretary who we read in the Bible again in Ezra 6 verse 6 was called Shethar Bozanai. And so we get an understanding of these roles. Who observed the affairs of the province, protected the revenues, and communicated his findings to the king. A garrison commander was appointed to protect the province and be responsible for the troops. And to ensure all of these people and systems operated well, there was also another independent royal inspector appointed who was responsible to complete additional checks on the governor and be the eyes and ears of King Darius. So what we see here is this multi-layered pro, uh, process of uh, small governor uh, governance with sub-provinces. Then we had a governor over them, then we had secretaries, we had commanders, and then we had people who were checking them again. So King Darius set up this very thorough system of making sure that there was always somebody checking somebody else. So although they were several regional headquarters for imperial administration, the governor and the administrators of the province of West Euphrates reported to the city of Babylon. And hence when we read the Bible through this period of time, we find what happened when there was a problem with Judea. They would write a letter to the king, and this is that system that they had to follow. The people who were writing the letter was, of course, the, the governor of the West Euphrates. Okay? So that was their position. Now the tributes or taxes, whether silver or gold, were required to be paid in 30 kilogram set measure called a talent. And we've mentioned the word talent in the Bible all the time. So one talent is worth 30 kilograms. And each talent could also be subdivided into 6,500 gram mina, spelled M-I-N-A. And each mina could then be subdivided into a further measure of 60 shekels, weighing 8.3 grams. Now when we read in the Bible, in the book of Ezekiel, this relationship between these weights and measures is actually there because the Lord says that you are to weigh and measure and be fair with your finances. So in Ezekiel chapter 45 verse 12, it says that 60 shekels are equivalent to one mina. So the Bible actually tells us what this measure is. 
So this is, I'm just giving you a, a background. So today, monetary value is based on the printed value, but in ancient times, monetary value was based only on the weight of a coin. To give some understanding of the value of this currency during the reign of the Persians, a talent of silver, which we said was 30 kilograms, was said to be worth the equivalent of nine years of skilled work. So one talent equal nine years of earnings. And so when we see those extraordinary sums of money that the Jewish people had when they returned from Babylonian exile, it makes you realize how much money they must have made while they were living there. Quite extraordinary. Now the Jews mainly used the silver shekel for their currency, but King Darius I also introduced a new universal currency called a daric to regulate trade throughout his empire at a set rate. Now I have a couple of pictures here for you which actually shows exactly what these are. So this is actually a coin, a Judean silver yehud coin which comes from the Persian period. So they have found some of these coins. And this coin here, this gold coin, is actually the Daric, and it's known because of the picture that's inscribed on it as a royal archer. Now the person whose head is on that, of course, is King Darius, because it's a Daric. So this silver shekel actually has an Aramaic inscription. There's these three letters up here. Uh, which was the lingua franca or the trading language throughout the Persian Achaemenid Empire at the time, so they were speaking Aramaic. The inscription Yehud or YHD, those three letters there, they uh, just paid a mention here that there's no vowels in ancient language, so when you learn Hebrew, there's no E's or U's or whatnot. Hence we have Yahweh with an A and an E inserted but it doesn't exist. And that was actually done later on by rabbis who inserted the letters in order that we could speak them from our tongue. And so the ancient coins reveal the same thing, that they don't have any vowels. But it says YHD, representative of Yehud. And as I've mentioned, this is the name of the Persians called the Jews. And they permitted them to mint their own coins. And so they permitted them to mint their own coins because it didn't matter what picture was on them because the value came from the silver itself, how much it actually weighed. So because the value of a coin was based on its weight and which precious metal was used, if a coin of greater value was needed, they didn't have the coins from each of the sub-provinces, they then had to go to the coin for the whole empire, and that was known as the Daric. Now, in 1 Chronicles, chapter 29, verse 7, this is during the time of King David. There's a scripture that says, They gave toward the work on the temple of God 5,000 talents. So we just mentioned, right? One talent is 30 uh, kilograms. And it says, And 10,000 darics of gold. And so we find the, the term daric is, excuse me, is used in the Bible. And it is a currency uh, which was used during the time uh, of the building of the temple. And so it was used earlier, and now it's been used under the name of the king. So we have a, uh, a friend by the name of Michael Darek, um, who's actually a Serbian, or believed to be of Serbian descent. And so we had a discussion about this a long time ago, because the word Darek is actually a Persian name. And so he believes he has a, per, a, a Serbian uh, background in his family, but perhaps his name indicates that his distant ancient relatives are actually from Persia. And so when we come and have a look at the, uh, the term Daric, it's often uh, usually assumed to only reflect the king's name, uh, but this is not so because it actually means golden. And so you can see the type of coin that it is. It's gold, and so it means golden. And so that's the correct reason for the name. So my good friend Michael, his surname Darek means that he is the golden boy. He's, uh, he's gold, so hence that name. So this can be verified, as said in the Bible, because of the scripture that I've just read out to you from 1 Chronicles. 
Now, issuing the Darek as a common currency improved international trade, passing through the province of Judea, but government tax revenues didn't grow much because what happened when they were sent back to Israel? They were sent back with one purpose, and that was to, do you remember? To build the temple, right? And so all of those people involved with building the temple, they were not to be taxed. And so you can imagine that the governor of the West Euphrates, Tatanai, he wasn't happy with them because he wasn't getting any taxes. And so he wants to get rid of them. And so this gives us a little bit more understanding about some of the angst between them and the fact that he was writing letters to the king to try and stop them. Now, King Darius feared what they call the God in heaven. So the Persian people, both King Cyrus the Great and King uh, Darius the Great here, they referred to him as the God in heaven and told the governor and his officials from the province of West Euphrates in Ezra chapter 7 verse 24 have no authority, that they have no authority to impose taxes, tribute or duty on any of the priests, Levites, singers, gatekeepers, temple servants or other workers at the house of God. And so that just reiterates what I've just been mentioning, that they weren't really able to collect any revenue. So God's hand, however, was on the heart of King Darius, ensuring that his people were being blessed. And so you can understand why the Jewish people have been prosperous, because when God sends them back and they don't have to pay taxes, they're rebuilding their temple, but they're also living and trading as well. And so we find that their wealth will build faster than another nation who doesn't have this same situation. So the taxes that were collected were not only used to maintain and improve the infrastructure in the empire, but were made available to the people of the empire through the formation, would you believe, of a state banking system to provide loans and credit. And so today, when you go to your local bank and you ask for a loan or credit, this is something that was being done back in the time of the Persian Empire. The reverence that King Darius had for the God of Israel once again set the Jews apart when he decreed that some of these funds were to be used to rebuild the Temple of Jerusalem. So now as the money that was being invested in the bank and loaned was being used to give to these people to rebuild. So in Ezra chapter 6 verse 8, it said the expenses of these men are to be fully paid out of the royal treasury from the revenues of trans Euphrates. So in other words, the taxes of the other people for this region are being used to rebuild the temple of Jerusalem for the Jewish people. And hence you can sort of understand a little bit about why I'm speaking about this tonight, because it gives you a, a different perspective or a better understanding on just how amazing what happened uh, was, because the system of governance in Persia actually favored the Jewish people with the hand of God upon them. Now, should the governor Tatanai, the secretary Shethar Bozanai, or any of the Persian officials disobey his decree, the king ordered in Ezra 6 verse 11 that a beam is to be pulled from his house and he is to be lifted up and impaled on it and for this crime his house is to be made a pile of rubble. And so in support of the Jewish people building their temple, not only did they have to hand over their revenue, but if they failed to do so, a beam was going to be removed from their house and the king was going to have them impaled uh, for not doing so. And so this is quite extraordinary. So the king then put his in own integrity on the line in Ezra 6 verse 12 and said, May God, who has caused his name to dwell there, overthrow any king or people who lives to hand to change this decree or to destroy this temple in Jerusalem. So again, as we're just summing up what's happened, we find that this whole Persian Empire, this, this trans-Euphrates or West-Euphrates province, is geared to supporting the rebuilding of the Temple of Jerusalem on pain of death. And we find that uh, the king, King Darius, is fully behind them and the God of Israel. So when King Darius spoke of the God of Israel, he called him the God of Heaven. He was, however, superstitious, and fear caused him to encourage burnt offerings to the God of heaven, so he and his sons could be blessed. In Ezra 6.10, it says they may offer sacrifices pleasing to the God of heaven, 
and pray for the well-being of the king and his sons. The important thing to note here is that King Darius didn't worship nor have a relationship with the God of Israel. He followed the same Achaemen of tolerance that King Cyrus the Great had shown the empire and honoured the decrees that had been set down before him. He supported many different religions that came with many different people from conquered nations as long as they were submissive, peaceful and paid their taxes. He even gave grants from his treasury for their needs as we've learnt with the Jewish people and King Darius was a wise ruler who understand that creating a peaceful and prosperous empire required freedom to practice religious and cultural beliefs. And so the people uh, in Judea, they were being threatened, but the reason that they weren't being overcome was because of the support of the king himself. So unifying currency and language for trade and governments of the Persian Empire, Abiad and the Jews had to develop a working knowledge of the Aramaic language, even though Hebrew was the language spoken by the Jewish people. And so we find in the region that the language that they spoke that was Hebrew until they were evicted from their kingdom was their native tongue. When they went to Babylonia, they were still speaking their native tongue. When they came back to the province of Judea, they still spoke their native tongue, but they had to learn what they call the lingua franca, a trading version of language to have enough speech to be able to communicate with all the people that would pass through and trade. And so Aramaic uh, actually spread around the world during the time of the Persian Empire. And we learn in the Bible that there's some passages that are actually written in Aramaic. Now the Persian Empire reached its peak in power and size under the reign of this particular king, King Darius I, and it included quite a large region. And so this next map that I have here shows you the extent of the region. So here's the Mediterranean Sea over here, the Black Sea over here, so this is Greece, this is the Caucasus Mountains, so this is all today's Turkey, the Caspian Sea, and then it goes over into all of these regions over here. We've got the Persian Gulf, Gulf of Oman, the Arabian Sea, we've got the Red Sea at the bottom here, and so it encompassed quite a large area. On this particular map that I've produced, I've mentioned all of the main events and the scriptures that go with it uh, for this period of the Bible. And so we find that Zerubbabel was released from Babylon to return to Jerusalem in 539 BC and we can date everything because the Bible very kindly tells us in reference to the reign of the kings when this happened and so in the first year of King Cyrus of Persia with Joshua the high priest and 42,360 exiles to rebuild the temple and the altar of God so this is the reason they were released and so on the map here from Babylon I've put on here, we've had other maps in the past, the path that they would have travelled uh, along the way. Now the Medo Persians led by King Cyrus conquered Babylonia and ended the, per the Babylon Empire uh, and the Persian Empire started in 539 BC. Now up here, we were looking at this last week, this note mentions about the Jewish leaders were encouraged by the prophets Haggai and Zechariah and they completed building the temple in 516 BC under the protection of the king we're speaking about, Darius, and the Bible tells us in the sixth year of the reign of Darius. So when we actually compile it all together, we get a very clear picture of what's going on. And so we find uh, there across here. Now, uh, we haven't come to this yet, but Ekbatana in Media, the former capital of the Median Empire, is actually where the burial site for Esther and Mordecai is. And so we've still got their story to come. We find, and we're going to talk about this in a moment, that uh, the former capital of Pasagade, which is where King Cyrus the Great uh, was buried, was actually uh, passed over and the new capital was built in Susa. And so you can see Susa is a lot closer to the middle of the empire. If you were to put a line here, east and west, it's a lot more central than where it was over here. And so they had a different palaces for different times of year, summer palaces and winter palaces. And so we find in Persepolis, and there's ruins in Iran today, that the winter palace for the kings and emperors of the Persian Empire resided here. Now as we move up through these notes, 
we've got that in, uh, let's get this in the right order, Ezra. So we looked at this last one. He's sent to Jerusalem from Babylon by King Darius, who identified was the Artaxerxes in 515 BC. And we can know this because it was in the seventh year of his reign. To appoint magistrates and judges to administer justice to all the people who know the laws of your God. So he allows all Israelites throughout the Persian Empire to return to Jerusalem. So we know there's no restriction on the people anywhere they live to actually return. And of course, when we come to the story of Nehemiah, which we're going to begin tonight, we find that when Nehemiah asked to go there, he's allowed to go. How did he find out that there was a problem in Jerusalem? Because his brother Hanani uh, was allowed to travel through the empire and go and see him. So we know there was no restrictions. So Nehemiah is a cupbearer to King Darius, and we're just going to head into this in a moment. And he went to Jerusalem from Susa, so this is where it was that he was, to rebuild the city walls and gates in the year 502 BC. It can be a bit confusing, it even confuses me, because the dating is going backwards all the time. So when you sort of look at it, you think, hang on, is that right? But we're actually going to smaller numbers rather than bigger numbers. So that happened in the 20th year of King Darius I, again, known as Artaxerxes, because they're using his title name. And we're going to come to those scriptures in a moment. The walls were finished in an astonishing 52 days of work on the 25th day of the month of Elul, which is September. And this again is referenced in the book of Nehemiah. We'll talk about this. But 52 days might seem an extraordinary effort to rebuild the walls of the city, but it's also a testament to how small the city actually was back in those times. It's not the city that it is today. And then finally, still yet to come, in 479 BC, King Xerxes now married Esther to become Queen of the Persian Empire. It says in the seventh year of his reign, her actions stopped the Jewish people throughout the Persian Empire from being exterminated by genocide in 474 BC, which was in the 12th year of Xerxes' reign. And so realistically, what the Bible is doing is it's giving all of the story, it's revealing God's plan, but it's actually very methodically telling us when everything happened as well. And so when we piece all of it together, we understand that the book of Esther, the book of Nehemiah, and the book of Ezra are all clearly from the Persian period in the Bible. Now, down at uh, the bottom here, and I'm just going to mention this before we move into the story of Nehemiah, we find that there's these countries today, and you might recognise or think of some yourself, it was Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, all these stands. In fact, India, does anyone know what the correct name for India is? Yeah. It's not actually India, it's called Hindustan. Okay, what's its religion? Hindu, Hindustan. And so he actually conquered five of the stands, as I call them. And so we have here that stand actually means it's a Persian word. So it's used still today, and it means it's a Persian suffix meaning the land of. And so, for example, if we look at the country Turkmenistan, it actually means the land of the Turkmen. And so the Turkmen actually came out of the steppes, out of the high hills here, and they came down and moved. We, we, we read that when we learnt about King Cyrus the Great. He came from down uh, the, uh, the, the steppes or the high country and moved down, migrated. And in history, the Turkish men did exactly the same. And that's why today in the corner of Iraq and Syria, there's still this problem with the racial tensions between the people who were from ancient times moved into this area and they now don't have a nation. And so we have this extraordinary situation. The history of what's going on in the Bible and this region is still a problem to this day. And so I hope that gives you a, a bit of an understanding uh, of the region and the place that Jerusalem and Judea has in it. It's a huge empire. It had 20 different governing regions. And we find that the region which is most blessed, of course, is the sub-province of Judah and the uh, governor of the west, uh, Euphrates province, is under the leash, so to speak, of King Darius to make sure that the decree of King Cyrus, whom God placed on his heart to return the people to build his temple. And so this extraordinary history surrounds this event of building God's temple. That's the whole story behind everything. Okay, so after the 
outer reaches of the Persian Achaemenid Empire were expanded by King Darius between 515 to 512 BC to include India to the east, hence Hindustan, like I just mentioned, the land of, Cyrene or Libya to the southwest, and Thrace, which is Greece to the northwest, so Libya, Thrace, and all the way over here uh, to India. And the Indian boundary, by the way, is different because India in those days was all one country. Pakistan is actually a modern separation, if you understand, in the, 19th, in the uh, 20th century. So, <coughs> so he uh, conquered all these areas and he stabilised his empire with this system of government we've mentioned. He built royal roads to connect all of the major cities and towns and a system of what's called caravanas caravanserais, uh, which is places which were, you know, like a roadhouse today, where you travel and stop for the night and then continue on, stop for the night, so you'd be able to follow these highways, you would have safe lodgings and food, and this was the system that he built. So he had a big picture, he didn't just conquer the, the places like the Babylonians, he actually established and unified them all by his governance and even by road systems. Now, as I said, he also began to construct two large palace cities called Persepolis and Susa, which I showed on the map, to replace Pasargadae as the capital of the Persian Empire. The reason why this is important is because where does the book of Nehemiah go to? Where do they start? They were in a palace at Susa. Who built the palace of Susa? King Darius I. So when we look at the book of Nehemiah and people argue about who Artaxerxes is, We've explained as a title name. We know that it's King Darius I because King Darius I was the person who built the palace there. He's the one who resided there. And so the period of history, when we start looking at it, there is not this huge gap in time, which some believe, between each of these events. Obviously, once the Zerubbabel had finished the temple and he finished the altar of God, God brought Ezra in to institute his laws and to teach the, uh, the, the, the word of the Lord to the people. And then he said that he would bring someone else to build the walls, and this is Nehemiah. Well, of course, they're not going to do all of this and then leave the walls down for 100 years or 200 years. Of course, it was something that was next. And so in the timing of things, this all aligns with King Darius. Now, This picture up here, I've put this up before, this is a, uh, a uh, rock carving, uh, a relief as they're known, of King Darius I. This is actually an image of what they believe that Susa actually looked like. And so the palace, the Apadana Palace, from which they actually rule from is actually down here. Because it's what they call a an, uh, an apostyle uh, hallway which means that it has all these pillars but it's got a hollow roof right? there's no solid roof that's in there and so when we talk about Nehemiah serving he would have been serving in this building now the footprint and the the, the remain of the tell the, the ancient hill is still in Iran today they have all the footprints for all the buildings so they know exactly where they were they also have some partial ruins and Amazingly, this frieze is actually taken from the eastern court of the Apadana Palace. They have more than this. And so these were actually along the top of the wall here, above the pillars. This is what they actually would have seen. And so they have a lot of really good information and understanding on what the buildings were like. And they can even see the colours because of these incredible tiles that they were making back in these ancient days. So this was uh, the location. So I'm trying to give you a bit of a, uh, an insight into where Nehemiah lived, what it looked like, <coughs> who his king was, and also some details. And there's many more pictures, I've only put one up, but some sophisticated workmanship that was happening in these ancient times. And so remember, we're placed now at about 500 BC. Now, so we're going to launch into the book of Nehemiah. So Nehemiah, before we start reading, just a bit of background, served as the cupbearer of the Persian king Darius I, whose title name is Artaxerxes, in his new capital city Susa. 
He received news from his brother Hanani and the plight of the, his people in Jerusalem. He learnt the walls and the gates of the city of Jerusalem were destroyed and his heart was moved to go there and rebuild. Before we start reading, what does it mean in the Bible when it says that his heart was moved? We heard that King Cyrus the Great's heart was moved. We hear that King Darius I in the story of Nehemiah and before, his heart was moved. We, Hanani goes and visits his brother and Nehemiah's heart was moved. What does that actually mean? What does it say when someone's heart is moved? He's touched. He's touched. But what's our heart? God's doing something in our heart. Right. Mm. And so when we read the Bible, we find that the place where God touches us or speaks to us is not in the here, in the mind, but in the heart. And so when he says he touches somebody's heart, he basically changes something inside somebody in order for them to do what the Lord wants. And so they have this obedience. When we read the Bible all the way through, the word heart, I've never actually looked it up, but it must occur thousands upon thousands of times throughout the Bible. And we always talk about when we, when we dedicate ourselves to the Lord, we're meant to dedicate our heart, mind, body and soul. And so we have these different defined aspects of us. So Zerubbabel had led many exiles back from Babylon in captivity to rebuild the altar and the temple of God. Ezra led a small group back and taught God's law to administer justice to his people. And now Nehemiah will go back to protect God's house, God's city and God's people but he will not return with any exile, so unlike those who went before him. So just understand that what Nehemiah is doing is the job of protection. Okay? So if you look at those three roles, Zerubbabel went and he built the means for God to come and dwell amongst his people and to make sacrifices towards him. Ezra came to institute the laws of God and to teach people the laws, administer justice. Now Nehemiah comes, he's there to encompass all of that, in other words, to protect what's been put in place. So they're the three functions of those three very special people. So seeking and being granted the protection of King Darius or Artaxerxes, Nehemiah will now fulfill yet another part of God's plan to restore his people back to Jerusalem and the promised land. Now we find that God chooses leaders who demonstrate their faith in the face of danger. There was always a threat against these people at all times. So whether they were confident or not, they placed their trust in him and believe he will protect and provide for all of their needs. And so I've put this chart, which I use on occasion up again, this explanation of how when someone sins, the Lord punishes them. When they repent, the Lord rescues them. And when he rescues them, he restores them back into relationship. This portion of the Bible of restoration, we not only see him restoring his people back into himself, but he's restoring his city and his temple back into place as well. And so this is a very significant moment. Part of the restoration program, if you will, is that King Cyrus the Great released Zerubbabel to rebuild the altar of God and the temple. King Darius the Great, his great nephew, funnily enough, they're both called the Great, these ones, and none of the other Persian kings are. So this is how extraordinary these two men were. So King Darius the Great released Ezra to teach God's laws, as I've said, minister justice, and he released Nehemiah to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem to protect God's house, God's city, and God's people. And so we see God's plan. We speak about the relevance of this in the New Testament. When we sin, Jesus took our punishment. When Jesus took our punishment, he rescued us and gave us the means to restore our relationship back with the Lord, with our Heavenly Father once again. And so this simple cycle, this sin cycle is a good way of having an overall picture of the Bible. 
So let's launch now into the story itself. So we are in 502 BC and Abiad, our descendants in the genealogy of Jesus, would have been five years of age at this time. And King Darius I, or Artaxerxes as he's termed in the book of Nehemiah, was in his twelfth year of reign. A Jewish cupbearer called Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, served the king at Susa, for this was his favourite palace. Remember we mentioned there was a winter and a summer palace. Nehemiah received a visit from his brother who had travelled all the way from the sub-province of Judea. And so we're going to go now to Nehemiah chapter 1 and read the first two verses, verses 1 and 2. So now we're going to dwell in the book of Nehemiah. So Nehemiah chapter 1 verses 1 to 2, it reads... In the month of Kislev, which is November to December in our calendar, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. His brother Hanani and the other men answered, and we're going to go to verse 3, Those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. And so we obviously realise that when people were actually dispersed, this is now the next generation, but we realise that some people didn't go back. We mentioned that before. And so clearly uh, Nehemiah is one of those who didn't go back. And yet his brother did go back and so we must understand through this that Nehemiah at some point in time has gone from wherever he was in uh, Babylonian exile when King Cyrus came in he's gone to serve the king at some point in time because his brother went back to Jerusalem and so we're talking about the same generation because he's talking about his brother so we know that there's not another generation or two generations between this story Now an angel who had spoke to the prophet Zechariah 18 years early in 520 BC, who we've spoke about, said the Lord had declared that Jerusalem will be a city without walls because of the great number of men and livestock in it. The Lord also declared that he would be a wall of fire around it. Both of those come from Zechariah chapter 2 verses 4 and 5. So when Zerubbabel, the father of Abiad, began to build the temple of Jerusalem, there was no need to build a wall to protect them. But now the temple was complete and the population of exiles continued to expand. The people in the sub-provinces around them became angry and sought to destroy them. When Nehemiah heard what his brother had to say, in Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 4, he says that he wept and for some days he mourned, fasted and prayed to God. So again for some days he mourned, fasted and prayed to God. Nehemiah confessed the sins of his people and acknowledged they had been disobedient to his commands, decrees and laws which is in Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 7. Uh, excuse me I'm not going to read the whole scriptures because it's um, we're just going to pull the key points out of the, the story. And so, acknowledging his people had been scattered because they were unfaithful, he asked God to remember the instruction he had given to Moses that said, and we're going to go to Nehemiah verse 9 now, Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 9, If you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Finally, Nehemiah petitioned the Lord in chapter 1, verse 11. He says, Give your servant success today by granting him favour in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. And so the introduction of the book of Nehemiah is that his brother comes and sees him, tells them of what's going on, and then his heart is touched to become this person who's going to go and do something about it. But the significant thing here is that he's in exile and he's in Susa, and yet he accepts the sin of his people corporately. 
he understands that he is one of them. He is a descendant. And so he too was expelled from the former kingdom of Judah. And so in order for him to have solidarity with his people, he doesn't sit in another place in another time now and say, well, it's got nothing to do to me. I didn't do it personally, which is one of the things that we have a problem with today. He says, no, we've got a problem. And I accept the burden of that problem before the Lord as well. And so he mourned and he fasted and he prayed corporately for his people. So I just want to explain here that whilst the title cupbearer describes the function of a high-ranking official or servant charged with the responsibility to prevent a king from being poisoned by food or drink, that's the common understanding of what a cupbearer does, his position required the complete confidence of the king. Omnipresent in the king's court, he was cognizant of the empire's intrigues as those who sought the king for matters of state were entertained in his presence. In other words, he heard everything. He knew everything that was going on. One of the only people, because even a general would come in, he would see him and he would leave. If somebody was governing another region, he would come in, see him and leave. Everybody would come in, see him and leave, but the only person that was there with the king all the time was in fact the cupbearer. The other person would be the vizier. So there's two roles there next to a, a king or an emperor. So the office of a king cupbearer came after the commanding general, the prime minister and the palace manager. And his authority also extended to practical duties. This is evidenced in the Bible when Joseph held in uh, captivity in the Pharaoh's prison, he asked the Pharaoh's chief cupbearer to intercede on his behalf to be released. In other words, you have the ear of the Pharaoh, can you speak to him on my behalf? Meaning that he's going to get heard. And again, when King Sennacherib of Assyria sent his officials to challenge King Hezekiah of Judah, his cupbearer was not only amongst them, but it was actually he who issued the challenge. And so we find that they have a very significant role, even politically. Then going to chapter 2 of Nehemiah now, uh, verse 1. So chapter 2, verse 1. It starts off and it says, In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and I gave it to the king. And so I'm going to mention here, because you ever do any study in this area, you'll find that there's people who have disagreements about this because there's an issue with the dates. And I've mentioned this about the dating system before. If we use the same Hebrew calendar system for when Nehemiah served the king his wine, and when his brother Hanani arrived in Susa, the month of Nisan in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes would be incompatible because it would fall eight months earlier than his brother's arrival in the same year. Do you understand that? So that means that the date that the Bible gives, if it's the same calendar system, means that there's an eight month difference before his brother's arrival, meaning that he's already fasted, prayed, spoken to the king, but his brother hasn't arrived yet for eight months. Well, clearly he did this in response to his brother arriving. So there's an issue there. So to explain this seemingly incompatible dating, it's necessary to understand that there are two different Hebrew calendars that are used. One was a civil calendar and the other was an ecclesiastical calendar. The civil calendar began and ended the year in autumn. So that's in Tishrei or September and October in the Christian calendar and was used to describe the month Hanani arrived in Susa. But after Nehemiah had mourned fast and prayed for some days, the Holy Bible says he brought wine to King Artaxerxes in the month of Nisan. The calendar used this time was the ecclesiastical calendar in which the year began and ended in spring, which is actually March to April. So just to sum it up, uh, and trying to keep it simple, from the month his brother Hanani arrived to when Nehemiah brought the wine to the king, four months had actually passed based on the year beginning in autumn. Okay, so there's two different calendar systems. And so one story was given from the point of view of the person who left Jerusalem because they're operating on one calendar. And when they arrived in Susa, they're operating on the opposite season calendar. And so there seems this incompatibility in time. But they're in fact uh, okay because they're, they're operating from a different start finish point. Okay, 
So saddened by the news his brother had given him, Nehemiah had been masking his feelings in the presence of the king. But on this occasion he did not hide his sadness and the king asked him, why in, so Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 2 now, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. So once again, we see how personal and close he was with the king. The king knows when he has a sad face or even bothers to take notice. The second thing here, it says, this can be nothing but sadness of the heart. So once again, we have this word heart come into play. So Nehemiah was afraid, but he gave his salutation to the king. And he says in verse 3, why should my face not look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? So can you just take note there as well, because there's a lot of dating going on with all of this and who, who is who. Notice what he actually says when he says, my fathers are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. So he's talking about multiple generations because it's plural but he's the next generation from his father, okay? So we know there's not a big difference in time once again. So the king asked what he wanted, and after praying to the Lord, Nehemiah answered in verse five, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my fathers are buried so that I can rebuild it. The king was sitting with his queen, who we can find out her name historically, it's not in the Bible, her name is Atossa, uh, which is a bit unfortunate in Australia because it has a different meaning, but Atossa spelled A-T-O-S-S-A, and she was the daughter of King Cyrus the Great, and so she was an older queen. Uh, so the king was sitting with his queen and didn't argue or refuse Nehemiah's request but asked him how long he needed and when he would return. A time was agreed and Nehemiah asked for letters to give to the various governors of the many sub-provinces within the Trans-Euphrates for safe passage and a letter for Asaph. So having explained that a little bit, you can see he's got to pass through all those regions and there's different sub-provinces everywhere so he has to have a letter of passage as he goes from one to another to another. So he asked for safe passage and a letter for Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, for timber to make beams for the gates of the city wall, the fortress built next to the temple, and for a residence for himself. So God's grace was upon Nehemiah, and the king not only granted his requests, but sent army officers and cavalry with him for safe passage. On his way to Jerusalem, he went to the many sub-provincial governors of the Trans-Euphrates and gave them the letters from the king. But all was not well, for two of these men, so we're going to go to verse 10, so we're going to introduce these names. Two of these men, Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official, heard about this. They were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. And so we see that this story of resistance continues. Now, Sanballat the Horonite... Does anyone have ever done any research on this and have any understanding of who he actually is or where he's from? Sambalat the Horonite was actually the governor, or the satrap as they call him in Persia, of the sub-province of Samaria. So in other words, the former northern kingdom of Israel, he's actually the governor. And that means that the northern border of this current province of Judah is actually borders with Samaria. And so we find that the governor just to the north, is not happy. So the, he says Sambalat the Horonite, and so what that means, he was either from a place uh, called Lower or Upper Bayat Haron, the House of Haron, which is on the border between the northern and southern kingdom. It's about 10 kilometers north of Jerusalem, in the former land of Ephraim. So that's the, the tribal region. So immediately to the north, this sub-province shared its southern border with the northern border, as I said, of Judea. It seems likely that Tobiah the Ammonite, the other fellow, was the secretary of Sambalat the Horonite, who as his official received the letter of correspondence from King Darius I, and that's in Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 17 to 19, so that's later in the story. But I'm just referencing it because he's the person who receives the letter of correspondence, so it's likely that he's the official there. 
Okay, so as the governor of the province of Samaria, Sambalat the Horonite was one of the governors to receive a letter from King Darius. He remembered how Zerubbabel, the governor of Judea, had refused his people's help to build the temple of Jerusalem when we read about that in Ezra chapter 4. So remember they came to help and then they said, no, only we get to build the temple. And so they're out of sorts with them. So now when he learned that Nehemiah had come to rebuild the city walls of Jerusalem, he was disturbed that Nehemiah had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites, as the Bible says. In the end that he felt at being refused to help build the temple had grown and now came between the people of Samaria and Judea. And so we roll into this new phase of the Bible story. So Nehemiah eventually arrived in the sub-province of Judea and went to Jerusalem where he stayed for three days. After resting, the Bible tells us what did he do? He went out when? At night time on horseback. He didn't go out during the day. So he didn't want to be seen to be scouting around doing something where people think he's up to no good. So he went out at night on horseback to inspect the walls of Jerusalem with a few men without informing anyone what God had laid on his heart. So the Bible tells us that leaving through the western side of Jerusalem, Nehemiah passed through the ruins of the valley gate where he saw the stone from the walls lay strewn on the ground, scorched by fire used to burn down the timber gates. He then went southwards, it says in chapter 2 verse 13, toward the jackal well and the dung gate. Now, I have a picture from Jerusalem when we were there, and this is the actual dung gate. This uh, roofing that you can see just through here is actually the entrance into the western wailing wall of the Temple of Jerusalem. And so when you go through there, just to your right is the actual wall of the Temple Mount. And so you come around this service road, you come out the Dung Gate, you go around to the left and then you head down into the Kidron Valley and across the other side to the Mount of Olives and the um, Garden of Gethsemane. So this, uh, this is uh, facing in this direction and behind us is actually uh, the, the, uh, all the graves that are up on the Mount of Olives at the moment. And so this is what it actually looks like. Now on the inside of this wall, on the other side, as you walk out, there's a plaque on the wall, written in three languages. It says the gate was originally a small wicket gate built by Solomon the Magnificent. It is named after the gate mentioned in the book of Nehemiah. So the Muslim leader actually named it after the former name given uh, in the book of Nehemiah. And so what do you suppose the Dun Gate was for? Any guesses there? <laughs> Not so hard. <laughs> right. And so, and so uh, the purpose of this particular gate was to dispose waste into the Hinnom Valley below from thousands of animal sacrifices in the temple and dung droppings collected from within the city. And so the gate that Nehemiah went out to be inconspicuous at night was through this gate where all of this waste was being carried out into the Hinnom Valley. So, so that gives you a, a, a bit of a look at what it looks like. Uh, so it says before turning northwards towards the fountain gate and the king's pool, so he's obviously going around all these gates, but there was a lack of room for his horse to pass through, so he moved a little further down in the Kidron Valley and continued so he could survey the damage done to the wall. After the survey was finished, Nehemiah returned back in the city through the valley gate. Satisfied that he understood what needed to be done, Nehemiah then spoke to those who would be doing the work. And so we go to Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 17. So verse 17, he said, You see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. So telling the people of in Jerusalem the support he had received from the king and the grace of God's hand upon him the people replied to Nehemiah again uh, in verse 18 and simply said let us start rebuilding so they agreed with him and so it was later in 502 BC that Nehemiah then became the next governor of Judea which we can reference in Nehemiah 5 verse 14 so we know he becomes the governor and work began to rebuild. So in other words, he was now in control. He went there to organize the people 
The other tasks have been done and obviously from the genealogy we can see that Zerubbabel has either passed away or moved on. Uh, his son's no longer given a functional role and so Nehemiah is the next one uh, to do his job. So as soon as Sambalat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite and Geshem the Arab, the Bible tells us, heard the building had begun, they teased them saying in Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 19, what is this you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? Nehemiah replied in verse 20, The God of heaven will give us success. We his servants will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. And so we're going to put this chart back up again. I mentioned this briefly in the beginning. We have this historical person uh, who's called Gashmu or Geshem ben Shabar. Ben means son of. And so Geshem ben Shah means son of Shah. And he's known as Geshem the Arab in the Bible. And so this person is a historically recorded person. So once again, we can verify the truth of everything that's said in the Bible. Now, Geshem the Arab is the only Arab person in the Bible who's actually specifically named. So there's no other Arab in the Bible who's actually named by his specific title or his first name. He was allied with Sambalat and Tobiah, the governor and the secretary of Samaria, and it's thought that he is the king of Kedar, as I've mentioned on the chart there, a vassal king of the Persian Empire called Gashmu, which is actually a Hebrew variant of the word Geshem in Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 6. And so we see a connection between those. Um, okay, so the Kedarites, who were a confederation of Arab tribes, I mentioned was the, he's the descendants of Kedar, and Kedar is the second son of Ishmael by Abraham. And so he's Isaac's half-brother, born by the Egyptian handmaid Hagar. So we find after all these years, one of the people that come back against him is actually a descendant of Abraham as well. So despite the threats, the building of the city wall and its gates were underway and it drew the combined effort of many people. Priests, Levites, officials, district rulers, city residents and those who had settled throughout the sub-province of Judea all came to help. Surprisingly, however, in Nehemiah chapter 3, we're going to verse 2, it says, Men from Gibeon and Mizpah, Melatea of Gibeon and Jadon of Merinoth, places under the authority of the governor of trans euphrates so once again that repetitive reference came to help once again however sambalat the governor of samaria became angry as the walls were being rebuilt he came with his associates and the army of samaria and said in uh, chapter 4 verse 2 sorry just going to keep skimming through the key verses what are those feeble jews doing will they restore their wall Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? Tobiah the Ammonite chipped in in verse 3 of chapter 4 and he says, What are they built? What they are building? If even a fox climbed up on it, he would break down their wall of stones. And so they're clearly mocking Nehemiah and those who are rebuilding. So Sambalat, Tobiah and those with them left and the returned exiles continued to build the walls. But when the walls had reached half their height and the gaps were being closed, again Sambalat, Tobiah and the Arabs came, but this time they were joined by the Ammonites and the men of Ashdod, the Bible tells us. So the Ammonites are the people on the other side of the Dead Sea in today's Jordan and Ashdod were actually Philistines who are still living in the region. So I have a picture there while I'm speaking. We're just about to wrap up um, of them rebuilding. And of course, we come to this in a moment, but you see that there's weapons that are actually being carried. And so while they're actually working, they're carrying weapons at the same time in order to protect themselves. So Sambalat, Tobiah and those with them left and their returned exiles continued to build. But when the walls, the, the walls were halfway, as I mentioned, these uh, Arabs came with Sambalat and Tobiah and their army 
and the Ammonites and the men of Ashdod, the Philistines. So obviously you can see what's going on. All these nations that are surrounding them are all talking to each other. They really want to stop them. So together they surrounded the province of Judea, and in their anger they plotted to join together to fight against Jerusalem and cause trouble. But Nehemiah and those who built the walls prayed to God, posted guards day and night, and continued. The men continued to toil, but their strength faded as the seemingly insurmountable task to move so much rubble began to plague their minds. The constant threat of their enemies also took its toll, and the people of Judea became aware of the plot to attack them. Fear overcame them, and they stopped working on the wall. And so we have a similar story to what happened when they built the temple. Fear stopped them in their tracks. And so this is a strong message for us when people lose their trust in the Lord and they begin to fear, they stop being obedient to God. And so we see this happen. And so in Nehemiah 4 verse 13 it says that Nehemiah stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears and bows and after checking the changes, he spoke to the nobles, officials and other people, saying in verse 14, Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your brothers, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. And so Nehemiah's role is not just to get this job done, but is actually to encourage the people to keep working at it. So Sambalat and his allies heard that the people of Judea had learnt of their plot, and in verse 15 of Nehemiah chapter 4, it says that God had frustrated it. So in other words, this idea of carrying weapons and placing families with weapons between the low points and the wall had obviously thwarted them because they probably expected they'd be able to come in without being known. So learning that the people of Judea had armed themselves and prepared to defend the walls of Jerusalem as they rebuilt them, they withdrew from progressing their plans any further. Now Nehemiah had given the many governors of the sub-provinces of West Euphrates letters from King Darius to ensure their safe passage to Jerusalem. But now that they were there, the satraps, or the governors, of these sub-provinces sought to intimidate the people of Judea to hinder their work because all these people they're naming, they're coming against them, are all ruling in the, in the surrounding regions which are all part of the Persian Empire. So God's work to rebuild his city and to protect his temple and his people was trying to be hindered by these neighbours. So faith requires action and this is one of the strong messages of the book of Nehemiah. We're not here doing a theological examination of the book of Nehemiah in this particular teaching but if we wanted to look at it or talk about it, simply faith requires action. So what is Nehemiah doing? No matter what's coming against them, he just says, keep going. Don't stop. We'll bring weapons in. We'll do this. We'll do that. But do not stop. And so if we have faith that God's going to protect us and we're going to be obedient to him, then we have to keep going in whatever our endeavours are. We mustn't stop. And so God's work to rebuild his city and to... Oh, sorry. So Nehemiah prayed first. So this is the other key. So Nehemiah prayed first and gave his people's fears to God before taking the necessary precautions to safeguard his people and the work they sought to complete. Now, you may recall that when Nehemiah first learnt of what happened from his brother, what did he do first before he approached the king? He prayed, mourned and fasted. And so the message of the book of Nehemiah tells us that in all things that we do, we must pray in the uptake of whatever our endeavours are and so faith requires us to action and part of the action that we must take is prayer and prayer is first so in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 you may all recall this it says that faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see so even though it's not finished yet and they maybe don't think that they can get there Faith requires us to do anyway. And so this is the message of Nehemiah. So this is what he did, and this is what he's to be commended for, because his faith in God overcame this adversity and frustrated the plot of his enemies. Now all those who had been working on the wall returned to their section again, but from that day on, Nehemiah changed strategy on the section of the wall his men had been working on, 
he had half of them wear a sword at their side and build, while the other half clothed in armour and equipped with spear shields and bows were assigned to keep watch and hence what we see on the picture behind me. The officers then stood behind those who worked and those who carried the materials worked with one hand and carried a weapon in the other. Finally there was a man assigned to sound the trumpet in, in case of attack and he was to stay with Nehemiah at all times. So they had a plan in case something happened. Work continued from the first light of dawn till the stars rose in the sky at night but to ensure the safety of his people, Nehemiah said to them in verse 22 of chapter 4, Have every man and his helper stay inside Jerusalem at night, so they can serve us as guards by night and workmen by day. This they did. And on that note, we're going to draw to a close. So the journey thus far is we've had a look at the political uh, and geographical circumstances of the Persian Empire. We learn a bit about who all these governors are and what the regions are and why they're significant in the Bible because they're actually located around them and they want to stop them. We see God's hand on this because he's financing them, he's uh, giving them all of what they need and of course when Nehemiah is called he goes all the way from Susa to Jerusalem in order to fulfill this task. When he gets there his duty is to rebuild the wall but in order for him to rebuild the wall, it becomes a message about faith and about faith in action. He also teaches his people here clearly that before he does everything, he always prays about it. And then once he's prayed about it, he puts it into action. And so a good message uh, for all of us. Okay, so next week we'll continue on with the book of Nehemiah. Um, chapter 4 and chapter 5 and so on um, as this wall is built um, and as I said this is uh, during the time of Abiod the son of Zerubbabel in the genealogy of Jesus so we just put up this uh, end screen uh, you can watch the video back on Facebook if you uh, so choose uh, the video has been recorded in a high definition video all of the references that I'm speaking will be put on a bar at the bottom of the screen for you to uh, to look up in your Bibles as you watch and so if you type in Paul Branson the Jesus Movement you can go to our YouTube channel and you can subscribe there or you can go to our website the videos are also placed there at the jesusmovement.com.au okay well thank you very much uh, God bless you and we look forward to your company next time